Next on BYU Sports Nation, high hopes, high expectations, and a summer trend of high energy. Which BYU sport has the highest amount of positive juice right now, football or basketball? College football insider Brett McMurphy joins us. Where does he see the Cougars bowling in the future? Plus, imagine this, the BYU dunk team on the Great Wall of China. Secure your tickets now. My grandma going to steal your ticket. Uh Uh-oh, let's go. This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Friday, June 7th, wherever, however you're connected, Always nice to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton alongside a guy who will take Mark Pope's grandma season tickets, Jerem Jordan. Depends on timing, right? you got to be quick. Uh, yesterday, BYU Basketball released a video with Mark Pope saying, hey, renew your season tickets by June 14th or else. Uh, and this is what it sounded like and looked like. First of all, thank you for supporting BYU men's basketball. We love when we walk in the Mary Center and the gym is full. So to keep that going, you have to renew your season tickets by June 14th because if you don't, I promise you, someone coming to get them, and it's probably my grandma. My grandma going to steal your tickets. If you don't renew by June 14th, my grandma, my uncle, my stepfather, I don't have a stepfather. They're going to come take your tickets, bro. Renew by June 14th. Grandma Pope going to steal your season tickets, bro. If you don't renew by June 14th. That's great. I happened to talk to Mark yesterday. He's, they must have shot that a while ago. He said, what did I say again? I said, no, you were hilarious, man. It's been a whirlwind <laughs> of recordings and meetings and recruiting. Like the last yep. few months for him have been absolutely bonkers. So I'm not surprised he doesn't remember when that was filmed specifically. But at least he's consistently no, no funny. What he said. At least he's consistently funny. I love it. We've got a fantastic show lineup today, including... Friend of the program, Brett McMurphy of Stadium Sports, college football insider and expert, has the latest details on the bowl scene and how BYU football might fit into those potential bowl tie-ins. We'll ask him where he thinks the Cougars are most likely to end up in those future bowl games. Plus, Zach Potts of the BYU dunk team recently returned from a trip to China. Why the highlight of that trip had nothing to do with dunking. Interesting stuff. We now present today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Team Fredette announced that Tyler Hawes, the all-time leading scorer in BYU basketball history, will join the team this summer for TBT, the basketball tournament, as well as former BYU coach Dave Rose, who will help on the bench. Last year, Team Fredette eliminated in the semifinals. Fun run. Regional games open July 19th with the championship games beginning in August. Utah has a significant tie to this tournament. Going to be fun. BYU won its seventh consecutive West Coast Conference Commissioner's Cup yesterday. Technically, you could call that the WCCCC title. The Cougars have won seven of the eight years in the league. The last seven, of course. Won by 18 and a half points over Gonzaga. Okay, you may have men's hoops, but we have the Commissioner's Cup Zags. The Cougars won West Coast Conference titles in women's cross country, soccer, volleyball, and softball. The men won cross country and baseball. That's pretty good. Women's track and field pushed four athletes through the qualifying rounds to Saturday's finals. Erica Burke Jarvis continues a remarkable season. Third place in the steeplechase in her qualifying heat to clinch her spot in the finals. Whitney Orton finished fifth in her heat of the 1,500 meters to automatically get into the final. Brenna Porter still rocking it, had the fifth fastest time in the 400-meter hurdle. She'll compete in today's final. Anna Camp Bennett finished third in the 800 meter with a personal best of two minutes, three seconds, 6,500s, and she'll run in Saturday's final. The ladies are pacing to score some points as well. Absolutely. And the Cougars on Team USA in volleyball, both men and women's, need to update. Uh, here it is. The ladies lost to Brazil in four sets. Mary Lake played in two sets. And the men lost to Italy in four. Uh, Davide Gardini on that team, by the way. Not sure if he made the travel squad, but he's a part of that. Ben Patch led the Americans with 24 points. Tomorrow, the men play Russia. I watched the last two sets of the wim- the women's match last night, and it was just fun to see Mary Lake playing on the big team, right? Pretty cool. The senior women's national team. It's outstanding. That's the highest level of volleyball she could 
be playing currently. Like, we'll watch multiple BYU Cougars play in the Olympics, I would imagine. Well, at least on the men's side. So cool. Hopefully Mary makes that team. great. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. You feel that? There's this infusion of positive juju, momentum, juice, whatever you want to call it, surrounding BYU sports, specifically the major sports of BYU basketball and BYU football. Jerem, right now on June 7th, which team has the most positive juice or momentum right now? BYU basketball with all of their changes or BYU football counting down to Utah coming off that perfect performance by Zach Wilson in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl? It's probably hoops because they're more in the news, right? And there's been big news. The first coaching change in almost 15 years. Obviously, Mark Pope's grandma uh, is involved. Uh, Yoli Childs came back, uh, you know, unlike Eric Mika and Elijah Bryant. So there's like added juice to him coming back because the previous two didn't, right? Whether that's fair or not. Jake Toulson's back at BYU, first team all league type player. Great schedule. We think this team could and should make the NCAA tournament. If football was more in the news and there was a little more there, perhaps um, they, they get my vote. But if football didn't play the schedule it has, perhaps two more winnable games on the schedule. I think maybe we'd be thinking more about football more consistently in spite of these changes, but because we think eight and five is kind of like realistic best case scenario for this team, it's hard to get up for eight and five, right? But men's hoops, it's easy to get up for, oh, is BYU going back to the NCAA tournament? We think so. Yeah. There are those that think BYU might do something they've never done and win some type of West Coast Conference championship now, as well as get back into the NCAA tournament. Ooh, Expectations ooh. are higher for BYU yeah. basketball pretty than they are for BYU me. football. I, like I know. It, I like it. I know. Expectations That's what are we higher. Do. Wait, listen. BYU, BYU sports fans are the first state marriage types. Oh, this might be the one. It's like, oh, my <laughs> gosh, calm down. It was one date. Right now, BYU basketball has the most positive juice. It's new, it's fresh, and it's kind of like, are you more excited about the Super Bowl coming up in February or the NBA Finals happening right now? Well, it's probably going to be your attention is on the NBA Finals because they're happening right now. Super Bowl's still awesome, but it's not going to be until February. And basketball has delivered some haymakers of sorts in the last few months. They've got a brand new coaching staff. Yoli Childs comes back unexpectedly and now brings this team, this veteran leader who was supposedly going pro like Eric Mika and Elijah Bryant. Well, that's all changed. And then you get the WAC player of the year, Jake Toulson. Those three things have changed everything for BYU basketball. They have all of the positive momentum and the expectations are higher for that team. So I think the juice is now more with them. If Yoli Childs didn't come back, I would say football, no doubt. But because Yoli Childs came back, that sways a lot right now. Obviously, this will change soon. Like, in 11 days, if we asked this question on media, football media day or the day after, we would probably say football. So it just, yeah, it varies. Now to topic two. In the preseason college basketball top 25s, Gonzaga is consistently a top 10 team or close to it. And St. Mary's is almost always in the mix as well. So let's ask this question. Would a third-place finish in the West Coast Conference be any kind of disappointment in Mark Pope's first season? This all depends on how good Gonzaga and St. Mary's really are. If both teams finish in the top 25 and win 25, 26 plus games and BYU is just behind them in third place of the WCC, fine by me with this qualifier. BYU still has a legitimate NCAA tournament resume. As long as they're in the NCAA tournament at large conversation, third place, whatever. If St. Mary's and Gonzaga are fantastic, then so be it. However, I'm of the impression that St. Mary's is being overvalued right now. BYU can beat that team. BYU beat essentially that team last year with less than they have on the roster right now. Yeah. That team did go to the NCAA tournament. They went to the team. NCAA tournament because they did something that so, the Cougars could not do, well, and they won that big game in Vegas. Yeah. yeah. They weren't going to the tournament unless they win that game. So – I think BYU can compete with St. Mary's. I think they're overvalued. I think they're a good team. Randy Bennett clearly knows what he's doing. And the Australian pipeline, and they keep bringing good players into Moraga, which is a mystery in and of itself. 
but I don't think they're top 25 in the preseason good. They're a top 40 team to me. They're not top 25. I think they're being overvalued. I think BYU is on par right now, just sheer talent to talent, roster to roster with St. Mary's. Yeah, and we're the only ones that think that, right? No one nationally yes. is putting BYU in that conversation. Um, if BYU, we know Gonzaga is going to be one of those things that you mentioned. It's whether St. Mary's is, right? And there's always been this thing with St. Mary's. BYU feels like it should be equal to or better than St. Mary's. Like, why not? BYU's got better facilities and better uh, funding. Uh, you'd, you'd think the talent's equal to or better. But that's good coaching, right? You d- they don't have good facilities. They don't have good location, per se. Although, you could argue Bay Area is a good spot. But Moraga specifically, like, within the Bay Area. Anyway, B- yeah, BYU, it, it's not about what place you finish in the West Coast Conference. Because last year, BYU finished tied for second with St. Mary's. That didn't matter. BYU didn't even make the NIT. What it matters is what you said. D- is BYU bubblicious? You could be third. This could be a three bid league. If you have two top 25 teams and you have BYU that's a top 40 team, that's how you get in. You got to be top 40. Then that's great. It doesn't really matter to me if BYU finishes in third, although they need to be competitive to finish in third, right? Um, taking third would be just fine. Remember, last year, BYU stumbled its way to the finish going one and three after they were the clear number two, controlled their own destiny. And that made it so BYU wasn't an NIT team. And then dominoes start to fall, right, with the retirement of Dave Rose and uh, the hiring of Mark Pope. So the place in the league doesn't necessarily matter because Gonzaga's going to win the regular season. And if you tie for second, hey, that's great. If you're in third, you could still make the NCAA tournament. Would anybody in their right mind care if BYU makes the NCAA tournament that they finished in third place of the West Coast Conference. No, that's, yeah, that's what we're saying. Exactly. No. Yeah, it's all about positioning for the NCAA tournament. Finally, topic three, and a would-you-rather edition presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Jerem, would you rather BYU football have a 1,000-yard rusher, a 1,000-yard receiver, they haven't had either of those in a while, it seems, or a 3,000-yard passer this season? This one's clear to me. It's 3,000-yard passer. A 1,000-yard rusher is nice. This isn't the Denver Broncos, right, where it's like every year, boom, boom. That tells you something about the offense. But you can have a 1,000-yard rusher and not be that good of a team. The Cougars have had one 3,000-yard passer since 09. That's crazy. Tanner Mangum in 2015. Zach Wilson could be a 10K guy if he's healthy. He really could. And a 3,000-yard passer is not crazy. Let's do some math, although I didn't take a math class at BYU somehow, which was awesome. Yes, I did graduate. You graduated? What? Remember that guy that Mm -hmm. we were in college? Mm -hmm. 250 a game over 12. That's all you need to do. 250 a game. Is that hard? Uh, 231 a game over 13. The last five seasons, an average of 35 players have thrown for 3K a year. I think Zach Wilson can be one of those guys. But sometimes we act like the means don't matter here. Oh, if you win... I don't care. We could run the option. That's not true. Ken Niamatololo wasn't hired part of, partially because of the option, right? Um, we want Ty Detmer and Jim McMahon again. Yes, right? This place wants passing. This place wants passing. Ty Detmer set up a run-heavy, beefy O-line offense that wasn't working, and BYU even fired Ty Detmer because they weren't passing the ball and they weren't scoring enough points. So Zach Wilson can be the guy that gets BYU back to some semblance of what they are. And I I think to really compete, BYU's got to be able to pass the rock well against these tough schedules. For whatever reason, when you were getting super animated about Ty Detmer getting fired, I had the Stephen A. Smith baby face pop into my mind and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> Even Ty Demma was fired from Brigham. <laughs> it's crazy, right? What's What's crazy to me is over the last two full seasons, we haven't had a thousand yard passer, rusher, or a three thousand. Uh, sorry, a thousand yard receiver, rusher, or three thousand yard passer. Two full seasons without any one of those. Well, you've won eleven games the last two years. That kind of tells you it, it's not just star power; it's getting it done. Like those things generally lead to yeah. points, right? Three thousand yard passer, please. That means great things for BYU football when your most important and most influential player, the quarterback, Zach Wilson, is at his best. It's not that hard. He's the most influential player in the game. If he's your best player, that only means good things for your team. You're right. BYU could have a 1,000-yard rusher and win six games. They could have a 1,000-yard receiver and win five or six games. If you have a 3,000-yard passer, I am hard-pressed to believe that BYU doesn't win at least 
seven games in the regular season and has a shot at eight in the bowl game. And if you really want to be a good team, that guy's pro- you've got to have some combination of both. Why was BYU so good 06 to 09? Because they had all of those several times. I know. You had, a, you had John Beck and Max Hall throwing for a minimum of 3K. You had Curtis Brown and Harvey Unger running for 1,000 yards every year. You had Austin Colley or a Dennis Pitta uh, receiving 1,000-plus yards, right? Cody Hoffman, even. It's pretty good, man. All the stats begin to count in how many days? The countdown to the youths. 83 days away. Matt Mendenhall, former number 83 defensive end in the late 70s, 1978 AP All-American. Honorable mention, 11 sacks in the 77 season alone. He thinks Giff Nilsson is awesome. Yeah, 77. Drafted by the Redskins, won a Super Bowl with that team. And Mark Wilson. That was the, both of them. Nice. Solid. Question of the day. Which team are you more excited about for the upcoming season, BYU football or BYU basketball? I'm intrigued by some of your responses. Time to hear from you. This is Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. At J. Gibbs 19 says, tough choice, but I'll go with BYU basketball. We can expect great things from both teams, Uh, but the awesome talent and the unknowns of BYU basketball are getting me more excited. To me, the ceiling's higher for hoops because of the way the game is set up. Basketball rewards the schedule. Football doesn't care about your schedule. They just care about wins, right? It, like, do I expect BYU football to be great? They could be great, but it might not manifest itself in the record. That's, that's the issue with the schedule. So Too Jay many. Gibbs points out the unknown, saying there are more unknowns with BYU basketball? I don't think so. I think there are more I, unknowns with BYU football. We I don't know we, how they're going to handle the schedule. We don't know how Zach Wilson's going to handle the first We feel four. like we, we don't know, know what BYU, BYU basketball is. is. BYU basketball has eight seniors, six scholarships. We think we know what they yeah, are. But I, I get the, well, it was a 19-win team, and you add Jake Toulson. Like, why would they suddenly make this, like, seven or eight-win New jump? staff, but new energy. That's the difference. Yeah, Absolutely. Coming up, last year it was Croatia. This year for the Women's World Cup, who will be the surprise team of the tournament? We're going to pick another secondary team. But first, Brett McMurphy, college football insider and expert of stadium sports, has the deets on all of the college football bowl details where would he put BYU with their tie-in this is BYU Sports Nation this segment brought to you by Delta Airlines climb higher BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU store the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere Tuesday, June 18th is BYU Football Media Day. Join us all day for web chats and other tremendous studio programming throughout the day on BYU TV and BYU Radio to get your fill of Cougar football in the summer. We are live in the studio bizzle. Been a while since I broke that one out. Your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play continues. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. We now welcome in on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline, college football insider, expert, and a guy who's been on the program several times, Brett McMurphy of Stadium Sports. Brett, nice to have you back on BYU Sports Nation. Great to be with you guys. Thank you. I think the question of the day for every BYU football fan is, where are the Cougars going to fit into this brand-new BYU bowl tie-in scenario with ESPN and their 16 games and everything else that's out there? So, Brett, where would you place BYU or think that the Cougars will be placed when these bowl tie-ins come out? Uh, like you said, one of about 12 games, uh, that's, that's the unfortunate thing is you won't be able to, unless ESPN and BYU announce before each season that they'll be headed to a specific game. But I I don't think it's going to be that way. I think going forward in 2020, that the non power five bowls will have a number of conference tie-ins for these bowl games, two or three, well, obviously two conferences, but they'll have more than two conferences for a lot of these games. So that will allow ESPN to move and match a lot of different matchups during the six year period. And obviously BYU will fit in somewhere. They will be guaranteed a spot somewhere, but I don't know if it's going to be as clear cut as it's been in the past where before going into the season, like this year, you know, you're headed to Hawaii. If you get the six wins, I don't know if it's going to be that clear cut. Maybe it will be. Obviously, BYU would like it that way. I just don't know with the flexibility that ESPN's doing with these these bowl games that they own, if if they would be that specific. Again, it's still a year out, so we'll find out. 
So are you saying there's going to be more flexibility in terms of who's going where when the postseason bowl games uh, shake out? Yeah, for those, again, ESPN owns 16 games, and of the of the 16, I think only four are really locked in with two conferences. So of the, I won't go through the whole list. If you want me to, I will. I'm sure you don't. But of the 16, <laughs> the, the four that BYU pretty much probably will never go to that ESPN, ESPN owns is the Fenway Park Bowl in Boston, the Texas Bowl, the Las Vegas Bowl, um, those three for certain, because those are locked in with two conferences. Those two conferences will be in those games every year. But then the remaining you know, 12 or 13 games involve non-Power 5 schools. So, for instance, the Myrtle Beach Bowl, that's probably not one BYU would go to. But for an example, for the six years of that bowl game, there's three conferences Conference USA, the Mid American, and the Sun Belt. So over that six-year period, those three conferences will play in that game at least four times during those six years. So they can move and match teams and conferences around within that bowl. So for one year, maybe a conference is light with number of bowl eligible teams. Then ESPN could slide BYU into the Myrtle Beach Bowl, for example. Obviously, geography-wise, that's probably not one they would want to go to but hey BYU's been to Miami Beach in the past so any anything's possible it's just there's about like I said 12 or 13 of those games that involve multiple more than two conferences so I think BYU would certainly be in the mix for any of those that are owned by ESPN. Brett McMurphy of Stadium Sports with us on BYU Sports Nation and maybe this next question I'm going to ask is Hard to answer, but BYU fans want the biggest, the best, the brightest spotlight, the most money. So of those 12 or 13 games, Brett, which of them are more desirable for the team, a team like BYU? You know, they're really, I mean, they may, they may be like half a million dollars difference, but they all, again, they're all the non-Power 5 Bowls. And so the the payouts are pretty similar. I don't think it's going to be a huge difference. For instance, if they go to the Frisco Bowl or the Hawaii Bowl or if they go to Armed Forces or they go to Boca Raton, it's really going to be a wash. Uh, The biggest thing will probably impact is how much they're going to spend on travel and take that off of what they would make from the bowl game. So I really don't see it being a big difference. Uh, You know, it's just, again, they want to make the, the best matchups, obviously geography-wise, and also, um, you know, whatever matchups present itself. Have we reached a point where we're not going to go beyond a certain number of bowl games, in your opinion? Because, hey, if we have 40 bowl games and there's 80 of the 130 teams, perhaps we can't fill all these bowls. Now we're throwing a 5-7 and seven team in there and APR comes in or whatever. Do you think there's a number that's kind of uh, the glass is full now? Well, the NCAA did that last year. We were at 40 bowl games, including – that includes the um, the title game. So we were at 39 bowl, 39 bowl games, uh, 78 teams. But then they allowed the addition of three new bowl games, <clears throat> excuse me, going forward in 2020. those That's the Fenway Park Bowl in Boston, the Myrtle Beach Bowl, and the uh, the Los Angeles Bowl. So they said that the the system could add three more bowl games. So now we're at 42 games, 84 teams, excluding the the championship game. And so that's for for the next six years. Now the NCAA, in two or three years, they can revisit this and say, hey, if there's a lot of six and six teams that are not going bowling, they could allow the addition of more bowl, bowl games. I don't think they're going to come and say, well, we're not, we're going to make these bowl games go dark because we've got five and seven teams. But they looked at the historical trend to the last half dozen years and decided that the bowl system could survive or could support uh, 42 games, 84 teams. So we'll have to see if, if that turns out. Some, some years you're going to have three or four, six and six teams that don't get in. And other years you may have two or three, five or seven teams get in, just kind of how how the season breaks. Brett McMurphy, college football insider for Stadium Sports on BYU Sports Nation. I'm almost afraid to ask this next question because I feel like we're opening Pandora's box again, Brett. But where does 
the expansion rumor or no, no, no. we get Brett on just to talk expansion. We found an excuse <laughs> with the bowl games, right? <laughs> well, where, where do you stand on all this? Do you, do you think that it's still imminent that at some point, whether it's 2023 or 2024, when these TV contracts come up, that some shifting will still happen? Or do you feel like things are pretty secure? You know, they're as secure as the power five leagues want them to be because they're the ones that will determine if there is going to be a, a huge shift. You know, if the, uh, the American decides to add somebody or the Sun Belt or whatever, that's, that's going to impact one team. It's not going to cause a huge domino effect. Uh, you know, I think expansion and the playoff are kind of tied in. We've got, we've got six more years or seven more years left with the college football playoff. That coincides with these new bowl agreements. So the new contract would start in 2026. I think if we do get one final round of expansion, that it would happen around 2024, 2025, or 2026. And I, it's it's simple, but it's not simple. If one of the power leagues goes to 16, then I think then at least three of the other power leagues go to 16 to reacting to the first power league. And then that starts the merry-go-round again, and then we'll have to see where everybody ends up. But I do think that would be the final, the final one. If the Power Five decide, hey, we're good where we're at, then I don't think we'll see any expansion. Um, you know, obviously for BYU fans, you want you want one of the power leagues to go to 16, because then, like I said, the other ones will react. You go to 16, they're going to have to pull teams up that are currently not in Power Five leagues to fill those spots and you know it's impossible to predict who those would be or what leagues would expand but certainly if that happens if there is movement uh you know BYU's got a shot if there's no movement then BYU doesn't have a shot UCF doesn't have a shot Houston USF you can name them all they're they're going to be stuck where they're at now what's more likely that expansion happens or that the power five uh football teams break away and form their own division I don't know if they I, – I thought that they would break away and form their own division. I think maybe at some point they might. But right now they're pretty much getting whatever they want. The NCAA is letting them come up with whatever rule changes they want. They can do those, uh, you know, as, as Power 5 leagues. They don't have to worry about the other schools being on board with them that are not in the Power Leagues. So they're kind of getting the best of both worlds right now. Ultimately, like everything else that's led to expansion and which led to the college football playoff, it boils down to money. So to answer your question, I don't know, but the, the, the correct answer is whatever makes them the most money is what is going to happen. If that means split off onto their own, if that means stay the way it is, if that means um, you know just designate a split within the NCAA between the power leagues and the non-power leagues, whatever is the best for them financially – that is the way, that's the way they're going to go. I, but I, it's it's really impossible to to say with any certainty what that would be. Brett, correct me if I'm wrong. You're uh, based in Tampa, Florida, correct? Yes. That's okay. Right. BYU makes a trip to play USF this fall. Where's the one place we need to eat in Tampa, Florida? Absolutely. Make your reservations right now for Burn Steakhouse. Burn it's, Steakhouse. Uh, We're writing it down. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been God. I don't know. It's been around sixty, seventy, eighty years. It's one of those iconic steakhouses. It's it's um, the the interior is incredible. They have a, this. I'm I'm not big into wine, but take the tour. They have a tour. You can do, go in the wine cellar. They've got you know thousand uh, dollar. Ten thousand dollar bottles of wines in there. They have a, they have a second floor dessert room that you have to have reservations to go just to go into the dessert room. Uh, yeah, it's incredible, and it it will sell. It will be. They will fill up fast. So when I say make your reservations now, I, I'm actually not joking. <laughs> yeah, October- if they will, if they will take them, make them. October 11th and 12th, the Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Let's go. Brett. I mean, that place, the, the week of the college football playoff, the week of the Super Bowl, that thing, it's, you can't get in there. It's impossible. But it's, uh, it's an iconic place. It's, it's pretty cool. The atmosphere is unreal. Plan to spend a good, uh, you know, two or three hours there and, 
incredible food, too. Fantastic stuff. Brett, always nice to catch up with you. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Brett. Anytime. Brett McMurphy, Stadium Sports College Football Insider, giving us not just the details on bowl games and potential expansion and Power Fives breaking away, but the place to eat in Tampa, Florida. Look, we don't get Brett on to talk about whatever he put out in his latest article. That's just the excuse for him to come on <laughs> so we can ask him about expansion. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's really interesting because no one's asked the question, what if no one does? Right? So he, he's saying there's a possibility that no one does, which uh, would be disappointing for this audience. Right? Coming up, back from China, Zach Potts slam dunks his way into Studio B. But first, Jerem... It's time, my friend, that we select our honorary World Cup team on the heels of what Croatia did with the BYU Sports Nation karma last summer. We're taking it to the Women's World Cup. This is BYU Sports Nation. This time we can root for the U.S. Friday, this is how we do it in Studio B. Welcome back to the show. Let's keep it rolling, BYU Sports Nation. If you missed the headlines the first time around, then you should pay attention right now. Team for Debt of the basketball tournament announcing Tyler Haas, BYU's all-time leading scorer, will join the squad this summer for TBT, the basketball tournament, as well as former BYU head coach Dave Rose, who will help coach the team on the bench. Last year, Team for Debt, led by Jimmer, eliminated in the semifinals. He's not playing this year, but he'll help coach as well. Regional games start July 19th with the championship games beginning in August. Yeah, I, I doubt Brandon Davies will play, too. He's too big of a deal now. Too much FC on the Barcelona, line. Or sorry, it would be BC Barcelona probably now, right? BYU won its seventh consecutive West Coast Conference Commissioner's Cup yesterday. Cougars have won seven of the eight years in the league, beat Gonzaga by 18 and a half points. Let's hope that's a men's basketball score as well. Cougars won West Coast Conference titles in women's cross country, soccer, volleyball, and softball, while the men won the cross country and baseball titles. BYU Women's Track and Field has now put four athletes through the qualifying rounds and into the finals. Erica Burke Jarvis, third place in the steeplechase to clinch her spot in that final run. Whitney Orton placed fifth in her heat of the 1,500 meters to automatically qualify for the finals. Brenna Porter, fifth fastest time in the 400-meter hurdles in Austin, Texas. She'll compete in today's final. Anna Camp Bennett took third in the 800 meter with a personal best two minutes, three seconds, 65 hundreds. They're all bringing it. She'll run in Saturday's final, and they're pacing to score some points as well. Volleyball, Team USA. Uh, the ladies lost to Brazil in four sets. Mary Lake played in two of those sets. And the men lost to Italy in four. Ben Patch at 24 points to lead Team USA. Tomorrow the men play Ruski. I know that none of you have forgotten last year the magical run that BYU Sports Nation had with Croatia. Well, Croatia had the run, and we just piggybacked on it. We didn't have the run. Yeah. During the World Cup, we picked Croatia randomly out of 32 teams. We couldn't have possibly known that they would make this run to the final. Like, it was... Unbelievable. And and the U.S. didn't qualify, so we said, well, we want a rooting interest, right? Now, the U.S. women are in this They're tournament. In. They're the best team. We're all in on the United States. We're going to win. We, the U.S., the Americans, we're going to win. Back-to-back World War champs, we're going to win this too, right? Okay. We won the World Cup uh, thrice in women's. But we want this other magical team again. Yes, yes. We want to see if the BYU Sports Nation karma extends into the Women's World Cup outside mm-hmm. of our rooting interest in Team USA. Mm-hmm. Now, things start in France today. And uh, you know what? We're just going to do it again. Even though the United States, as you pointed out, Jerem, they're in. Are a favorite to we're, win it. We're all in on that. We love the red, white, and blue. Of course. We now go to a secure, secluded room where the security and law firm of Bagley, Lewis, and Wallace are about to conduct our blind draw for our Women's World Cup team, aside from the United States, this go-around. Okay. Blind draw, looks like. Oh, now he's looking up. Okay. Interesting. Okay, Ben has selected the team. He's putting it into an envelope. Or an envelope. Oh, he oh a sealed envelope, oh, Jerem. Oh, he licked it? We're still doing that in 2019? Okay. A I th- sealed I we had one, envelope. So we didn't have to do that with. Here comes Hayden Wallace. Okay, now he's from England. He, uh, we think, knows the game more, right? Um, Queens Park Rangers guy, QPR, we love it, uh, which is in the, the championship. He's rounding the corner. He's delivering this. <laughs> it's really intense. Okay. The music is amazing. Yeah, he's uh, he's coming into Studio B. All right. Yeah, here he is. Hayden Wallace into Studio B Thank with you. the sealed envelope. He's, he's going to call the men's soccer games as well, by the way. Fantastic. Yeah, awesome. Okay, it says confidential. We don't know what team it is. We've stepped up our game from the last time around. This seems a little bit more high tech. 
Could sealed I? envelope, and there's actually writing on the envelope. You and I have very different uh, opinions of what high tech I know, means. I know. Okay. High tech, this is called low budget. <laughs> okay. And the team that we will secondarily root for in the Women's World Cup besides the United States is... Here we go. Netherlands. The Netherlands. The Dutch. Okay. Okay, Team Netherlands, okay. along with the United States, are the two teams that BYU Sports Nation will root for okay. in the Women's World Cup. They're in Group E with Canada, New Zealand, and I believe Cameroon. Let's go, Netherlands. I don't know anything about Netherlands women's soccer, but uh, we are emerging from Group E. There is one thing I regret about the last time we did this, not buying a Croatian soccer jersey, like an authentic one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I want an authentic Netherlands women's soccer jersey either, but we'll see. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Netherlands, baby. (laughs) I'd be feeling better if uh, we had the men. The the uh, Dutch. Let's officially okay. Let's officially give the entire country of the Netherlands, the that lands that are in the nether regions, the Dutch, Holland, Jeffrey R. Holland. You all get the karma. Here comes okay? the karma. Yeah, here it Soak comes. Soak it in, Netherlands. Don't uh, don't fall over from how powerful this could be for you in the Women's World Cup. So little do they know what it did for Croatia. No, watch they don't win a game and they're just out. We're like, oh. Or for Clayton Young, who just became the 10K Outdoor National yeah. Champion for his visit. To and they were paying game. attention to that, surely. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, they have the karma, Jerem. Now we watch and wait. See what they Beat do. Cameroon. Now I'm going to be watching their games too. Yeah. <laughs> So random, but I love it. That's our show uh, programming. Coming up, Cougars in the Miners raked yesterday. What does that mean? But first, Zach Potts for the BYU dunk team Mm -hmm. dances his way in here. Wow. After dancing his way around China. This is BYU Sports Nation. Dancing in the lobby. Look at that. Holy thank BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store. The official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Tuesday, June 18th is BYU Football Media Day. That means free BYU Sports Nation. Not one, but two hours of the show. Players and coaches will join us as we give you the goods as the Cougars prep for Utah. We just picked our random Women's World Cup team aside from the United States. It is the Netherlands. It just says Netherlands. Right now. The Netherlands? The Netherlands are ranked number eight in the FIFA Women's oh, World Rankings. We got, a, we got a decent team. Sweet. A top ten team. Maybe a semi-run. Their highest ranking ever is number seven, but this is a team that has been on the rise in the last three years. They made the jump from the 12-13 area up to top ten over the last three years. So, hey, we, we feel like we've got a chance. We've got a shot to do something special here. <laughs> yeah. BYU Sports Nation Karma. Let's go. We or- we are going to do it. Now we can wear orange every day. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, my friends. After that amazing reintroduction of the Netherlands to BYU Sports Nation, our question of the day, which team are you most excited about for the upcoming season? BYU football, BYU basketball, or the Netherlands? <laughs> I kid. Is it football yeah, or basketball? Come on. At Cool Mr. C on Instagram answers BYU basketball. Love to see a fresh new head coach. Yoli Childs is back. This year is going to be explosive. Let's hope so, man. Expectations are higher for basketball than they are for football, so I feel like the juice is there. It's there, right? They're an NCAA tournament team. All right, much more to discuss, including a BYU dunk spectacular with BYU dunk team superstar Zach Potts. Zach, welcome into Studio B. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here. Okay, we've been seeing and hearing because I know we sent a crew over there with you guys. Uh, You guys went to China. We did. The dunk team and I guess who else was there? A lot of the performing arts teams, right? So yeah, as far as athletics goes, uh, there was us and the Cougarettes and then the performing arts, there was the young ambassadors, there was... They always get to go in folk dance. They're legit, right? No, they're awesome. They go all the time. So, But this was our first international like tour, I guess. So it was one of the coolest things I've ever got to done as the dunk team. Tell us where you went and how was it? So we got to go to Beijing. We went to Xi'an and Shanghai. Uh, It was amazing. I think most of our favorite city was uh, Xi'an. There, I don't know why, they had this great, like amazing festival that was going on nationwide, but they had a street street right behind our apartment um, that was just lined with lights and with people dancing and singing. And it, it was amazing. 
So awesome. we had a good I hope time. you saw a Jimmer jersey somewhere in Shanghai. I actually didn't. I was very surprised and kind of Just disappointed. Just say you did. I did. It, they <laughs> love the people there. <laughs> so we're seeing some video of you guys dance. And, and so explain who you guys are, too, because we see you at the basketball games, notably. I know a lot of that group end up doing stuff with the jazz, I, I think, too, right? So yeah, absolutely. Who are you guys? What do you do? You uh, dunk, but... Right. It's so, more than that. It's, it's more, more than, than that, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, basically, we're all entertainers. A lot of us come from various different backgrounds. Uh, I don't think you'll find two of the same people who have the same background on our team. Uh, we've got gymnasts. We've got like people like me. I did pole vault and, and wrestling when I was in high school. Mm. Um, we've got football players. We've got just straight athletes, you know. Um, and we've all just found this niche where we, we can pull our talents together and, and – entertain the crowd in a way that's different from anything you've ever seen before um so it's a blast we love it i mean we're watching images of you break dancing at this chinese street festival how did this happen how did that come about uh so like i said this is in xian and there there was this this festival going on right right behind where we were staying the hotel we were staying at and we were just walking down the street and we saw this band who was playing they were from the ukraine um but they were playing uh, one of their songs, and we just started dancing, and we were just having a good time on those lit up floors. Um, and then suddenly, before we knew it, there was just a crowd of Chinese people surrounding us, just with all with their phones out, just taking videos of us. Uh, and so we just made the most of it, and we just started going going to town, break dancing, and doing flips and stuff. And that's what you do. You're not like shy about it, right? No, exactly. <laughs> like, we're, we're pretty used to it. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we see you at what halftime of the men's basketball games mainly. Is yeah. that where people will see you? Some in of the promo? women's games too. So we go to the women's games. We go right. to the men's games. Uh, most recently, this past year, we've really gotten started with what's called Cougar Strong Assemblies. Um, so we've been going to elementary schools and, and putting on these performances for, for the youth around uh, Utah Valley and just um, helping them understand what it means to be Cougar Strong, which is physically, mentally, um, and socially strong. And, and through that, we just we give our performances, we hype up the kids, and we, we try to help them become better people. Do you think you earned another international trip? Uh, I absolutely think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, we performed like to the best we've ever performed in our entire lives. I think our, our percentage of, of dunks hit to dunks miss was the highest we've ever had in our oh, entire nice. life. So we, uh, I sh- we would love to go again. So. You and Jim are in China, right? Absolutely. It's just like Let's have it seventy-three point. Yeah. We'll just throw them into our show. Yeah. <laughs> I'm intrigued because obviously this takes a ton of training and a ton of practice. So how much of that goes into before you solidify a show or a routine? Right. So. Uh, like I said, it takes a lot of a lot of practice, a lot of discipline. Most of us have been on this team uh, for at least three years. This is my fourth and final year, and I think we only had one other guy who was uh, only on the team for two years. The rest of us have been on for at least three years, and so we've been working together for a long time. We've been practicing together for a long time, and so we all like as much as it is talent and and ability, it's also trust uh, within our team. So I can trust that Marcus or Skyler or or Grant are, is going to make the pass so that I can dunk it, or they trust me that I can make that pass so that um, they can go as hard as they can and, and dunk that ball. Um, so as much as it is as it is ability, it's just trust and consistency. We've seen some video of you guys in some notable places in China, most notably the Great Wall of China. What was it like to uh, to do some flips on the Great Wall, dude? <laughs> it was pretty cool. I I think when I first got to the Great Wall, I expected just to like really take it in and, and just be like, oh, this is amazing, which which we did, of course. But once we were there, we just decided to have fun with like, it now and, and make it the best. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's the wall. It extends from one end to the other. So let's let's make the most of it and, and get some awesome shots. What's your favorite BYU dunk of all time? Oh, man. Favorite BYU dunk I think is it would be arm and arm. So that's when we, we have one guy just standing there right in front of the trampoline with another guy in his arms, like doing a handstand in his arms with okay. his legs split. And then another guy goes and jumps off the trampoline and does a front flip in between his legs and dunks it. Oh. Uh, it's a ton of fun. Who thinks of this? Crazy people. Crazy people <laughs> like us. Clearly. So. A lot of those around here. Right. Uh, yeah. You guys interact with Cosmo, right? Because you're, you're, doing, you're doing dunks with yeah. Cosmo, right? Absolutely. We, uh, I mean, part of our gig is, is we're part of his stunt team. So anytime he, mm-hmm. he needs people to throw him, anytime he needs people to... Uh, be beneath him as he climbs on top of him and falls to a dunk. That's that's us. Is Cosmo the king among you? Is he the alpha? Oh, absolutely. Cosmo. No, no one competes with Cosmo. Not us. Not any other mascot. Cosmo is. It's true. Is number one. It's true. He is the number one. Back in the day, the president of the university used to surprise everybody and be Cosmo. Oh yeah. And be like that. They, they would reveal in front of the whole student body who Cosmo was that year. Yeah. So Ernest Wilkinson, Dallin H. Oaks, all those guys <laughs> who would do. It. I want Kevin Worthen. 
to do this at some point. I think it'd be awesome. You know, I want to say we actually, there was a video at one point where uh, Cosmo was doing the Napoleon Dynamite dance. And then at the very end, Kevin Worthen takes, takes the head off. So, I fine I footage. Seen this. Wow. Fine love footage. I haven't seen this. Wow. Who knew uh, K Dub could dance like yeah, that? Yeah, we need to track this down. Zach. Really cool stuff. Seven Sun flag, man. Absolutely. Yeah. We need a member of the BYU Dunk team. Absolutely. And their signature on the Sailor Coog flag. Yeah. Yes, let's Well, thanks for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate and, it. And uh, I, I know uh, you can yeah, sign right now if you want, but I know we sent a crew to China, so I look forward to whatever comes out of that uh, from that trip. Well, I mean, the images is incredible. we saw, just the few things yeah. we saw during the interview, outstanding so cool. stuff. So cool. Coming up, the Cougars continue to do work in Austin at Track and Field Nationals. We have the latest from Longhorn State. Plus, ceiling fans and shout-outs. What do they have to do with each other today? This is BYU Sports Nation. Shout-out to today's guest, Brett McMurphy, college football insider from Stadium Sports. We talked about expansion and Zach Potts, who just recently returned with the BYU dunk team from the land of China. I want to get out of this monitor. This is weird. Uh, shows on demand via the podcast and BYT and BYU radio apps. Let's whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Jimmer! Team Fredette of the Basketball Tournament, the most originally named tournament of all time, or TBT, announced Tyler Haas will join the team this summer, as well as Coach Dave Rose. Athletics News. BYU won its seventh consecutive West Coast Conference Commissioner's Cup, or the WCCCC. Thanks to outright championships in men's and women's cross country, women's soccer, volleyball, softball, baseball, Ronnie Jones Perry won the WCC Mike Galeran Scholar Athlete of the Year Award. Congratulations to all. Track and field. Nationals continue in Austin, Texas. Yesterday, Erica Burke Jarvis advanced in the steeplechase with a run of 952.45 to get to the finals. Whitney Orton advanced in the 1500. Brenna Porter had the fifth fastest 400 hurdles to get to today's final. Anna Camp Bennett took third in the 800 semis with a personal best of 203.65. And Brian Matthews finished 11th in the decathlon with a career best. Volleyball. Both the men's and women's United States senior national teams lost their matches yesterday, three sets to one. The men dropping. Their match to Italy, the women losing in Nebraska to Brazil. Ben Patch did lead the B, the PYU, the United States men's team with 24 points. BYU Americans. I know, I know. Mary Lake played the third and fourth sets with Team USA. Her stats were not recorded. Tennis. I like the United States Cougars. <laughs> yes. The men's team took second in the Mountain Region. Three singles players were in the top 20, as well as three double teams in the top 10. Softball. Gordy Bravo has been added to the Cleveland Comets in the National Pro Fast Pitch League. Cougars in the minors. Wait, are there multiple Fast Pitch Leagues? I didn't, yeah, even, I didn't even know there was one. In AAA, Jacob Brugman and the Tacoma Rainiers fell to the Memphis Redbirds 7 0. Brugman had half of his team's hits, going 3 for 4 with the triple. Jacob Hanneman goes 1 for 2 in an Iowa Cubs 8 to 5 loss to the El Paso Chihuahua. And Brendan Lund of the Salt Lake Bees went 2 for 4 with two runs and an RBI in a 13 7 win over the San Antonio Mission Trips. Colton Shaver, the big bopper, a scary shot he would call him. One for four Get with a that double. Man a contract. An RBI in an eight to one win for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers over the Wilmington Blue Rocks. Not to be confused with the Red Rocks or the Green Rocks. Class A advanced ball. Today's rise and shout outs. Jaron, for me, it goes to Connor Weaver, who posted this video of. A bunch of track and field team members and Trathlete. friends watching Clayton Young and the two Connors finish first, third, and fourth in that 10K a couple of nights ago. Can we add uh, Isaac Wood's scream to this simultaneously? Is that possible? There you go. There it is. <laughs> they got so excited they broke, they broke a ceiling fan. Well, as Michael Jordan once told us, the ceiling is the roof, Spencer. So there you go. <laughs> Mine goes in the same mill. Go we, we need hype men like that. Like, find yourself a hype crowd like they had, that. They had height men as well. So great. BYU Olympic sports. An athletic department is comprised of many pieces. Football and men's basketball get the most pub. BYU has tremendous Olympic sports. We have seen that the last couple of days. We see that every year. It's just awesome to see that every, almost everyone thrives and is really good. This is a tremendous athletic department. Absolutely. I, I echo that wholeheartedly. Our elite voice of the day presented by Sundance Mountain Resort celebrating 50 years. Which team has the most juice right now? BYU basketball or BYU football? Skylar Beltran on Instagram answers. Football. 
best schedule in history. Oh, in history! A young star at quarterback, starting with Utah in 83 days, and ultimately football is king. Yeah. Okay. You can't go wrong with those. Both both are juicy. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, we ran out of time. Speaking of juicy. Conversation continues 24-7 <laughs> on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYU. What yourself. does that even mean? That's uh, for you to decide. <laughs> For Jeremiah Spencer, shout out to Jason Cooper, another number 83. See you Monday for BYU Sports Nation. 83 days to football. Go Kooks. 83 days.